Good afternoon and welcome to the NCBI webinar on using OSIRIS. My name is Ben Busby and I'm the Genomics Outreach Coordinator for NCBI. I'm joined today by George Riley, Rob Gore, Doug Hoffman, and Tao Tao, all staff scientists here at NCBI, uh, many of whom have worked on the OSIRIS project. We still have a few people coming in the door. <clears throat> And we're going to start in just a couple of minutes. Um, while people are still coming in the door, I wanted to show those of you who are more biologically oriented that NCBI, in fact, has a series of webinars. Um, and we'll be talking about our API next month, as well as downloading genomic sequences uh, the month after. This webinar, um, once we get the closed caption straightened out in about two weeks, uh, will go in the archives, and you'll be able to refer back to the video of this webinar through the archived webinars tab. To get to this page, you can simply Google NCBI webinars. Asking questions in this webinar, uh, please type them into the chat module. Or I'm, I apologize, the questions module, uh, which you'll see in the go to webinar uh, control interface on the right side of your screen. Like I said, type in questions. Quick technical questions uh, we'll just answer uh, via chat. And then um, more complex questions, what we'll do is we'll ask George at the end um, and make sure he's straightened out with those. Now I'm going to turn the presentation over to George Riley, who is going to tell you about the OSIRIS analysis software. Hi, I'm George Riley. I'm a staff scientist at NCBI. I have experience in um, biology and forensic DNA analysis. So I was a forensic DNA analyst and DNA laboratory director for 10 years, um, and additional experience in laboratory quality systems. Today I'd like to talk to you about the OSIRIS STR analysis software and do a short demonstration. I'm going to start the slideshow at this point. Okay, so today we'll talk about um, OSIRIS software and it's, there we go. First off, OSIRIS is the open source independent review and interpretation software. It's public domain software. I'd like to point out that the commercial manufacturers and products that we mentioned today are um, only mentioned incidentally and don't imply endorsement by NCBI or NIH. OSIRIS was uh, conceived in response to recommendations um, from the World Trade Center Victim Identification Project. It was first tested in <clears throat> a pre-release mode in the Hurricane Katrina victim identification on which I worked um, and was further developed in collaboration with federal and state laboratories and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Um, OSIRIS is designed to give rapid STR analysis with the identification of artifacts. It's been accepted by ANDIS as an expert system for doing CODIS um, convicted offender analysis. It is public domain software, so it's freely available for download from the NCBI OSIRIS homepage. I would point out, please do sign up for the announcements on that page so that you'll get um, announcements of a new version which is coming out soon. Today we'll be discussing version 2.3, but uh, version 2.4 will be available soon. The source code is publicly available on GitHub as well. OSIRIS runs on Windows XP, Windows 7. I'm told it runs on Windows 8, though we have not extensively tested that, and it runs on the Macintosh as well. It analyzes data in the FSA and HID file formats, which are produced on the Applied Biosystems 310, 3100 series, 3500, and, 35, and 3700 series genetic analyzers. It's not limited by the number of STR kit dye colors, so if somebody invents a kit that has um, eight colors or more, it will work on OSIRIS. It's also, if it's run on the network, um, it's not limited to a certain number of users, 
very fast at a quarter of a second per sample. OSIRIS will analyze an entire 96 well plate in under 30 seconds. OSIRIS works differently than most of the other uh, STR analysis software. It has a mathematical basis. It works by fitting mathematical curves to the raw data peaks. The alleles are fitted to double Gaussian curves, and the artifacts such as spikes, blobs, split peaks, which are called craters, we call craters, um, have other mathematical signatures. The controls, the ILS and the ladder, the time is mapped to the base pair sizes using a cubic spline. And when analyzing samples, OSIRIS does something a little bit different than other software. What it does is it takes each sample and compares the sample ILS, the ladder ILS, to ensure the best sample to ladder ILS fit. That means that you get less shifting um, with, when you do your analysis. Then you do peak identification and artifact identification. OSIRIS introduces some new quality metrics, um, which we'll talk about a little later, and it also does something interesting in that we uh, set different artifact priorities. It's critical artifacts. These are artifacts which indicate um, actual issues in quality and require review and non-critical artifacts, which the laboratory has decided um, do not need review. OSIRIS introduces a number of concepts, including fit, the goodness of fit of the mathematical curve to the raw data peak. This is one of the new quality metrics. Another quality metric is residual. This indicates the distance that the peak, the sample peak, shifts away from the latter peak center. And there's primary pull-up. This is the peak that causes pull-up. And finally, peak has restricted priority. These are non-critical artifacts which fall below a, a threshold, either the analysis threshold, stutter threshold, et cetera. Um, and those do not get a real cause. So the take-home is that OSIRIS is fast and flexible with STR analysis. Um, it gives you automatable profile QC with artifact identification. It has a very flexible export so that you can actually get your data into whatever tables or links you can write. It's validated as an expert system for CODA samples and it's by the Illinois State Police CODIS Laboratory and it's been validated for casework um, by the U.S. Army Crime Lab. Basically, what it's designed to do is increase accuracy and reduce the amount of time that you spend looking at your profiles. When you're looking at OSIRIS, there are a couple of things that can be very helpful. The Help menu and F1 will allow you to access the user's guide. The Table of Contents um, and Adobe Reader bookmarks and Control F can be used when you're looking at that user's guide to ensure that you um, can find what you're looking for. Finally, I definitely would look at the FAQ and the troubleshooting guide, which are in the appendices of the user's guide, because that has the information that will help you with a lot of the problems that you might run into. Um, you can, in the program itself, hover over buttons for tool tips, telling what the buttons do. And as a sneaky way of getting your data out quick and dirty, you can actually, when you're in the table view, you can do press control C or command C on the Mac and you can then paste your data, your little calls, straight into a print spreadsheet. When you're installing OSIRIS, it does not require administrative privileges. Um, however, you do have to have the right privileges in the installation directory that you put in. So, um, for example, in your documents directory or on the desktop directory, you have uh, right privileges. Those are good places to put it. Alternatively, if you put it into something like the um, into the programs file on a PC, you can change the right privileges for the installation directory. Um, so setting up for forensic casework, uh, there are a couple of things that I would suggest strongly. One of them is doing normalization for, this is for baseline subtraction. And there's also differential filter settings for mixture calculations. So if you're doing mixture calculations using software, you can actually set OSIRIS up so that it will treat 
your reference samples, your knowns differently from your mixture samples and will apply filters um, or not apply filters to mixture calculation, your mixture samples as you choose. Normalization basically for baseline subtraction as you can see here. Um, this has been normalized. It's had the baseline subtracted from the raw data. So the, the light pink line here, you can see that is the baseline that was subtracted from the raw data. You can see the, the raw data here with the noise included it gives you a very flat baseline. That's important because this small stutter peak would have been probably half again as high um, if it had had that baseline included in its peak height. So when you start OSIRIS, <clears throat> the first thing that you'll see is you'll see the logo. And if you have um, done analysis before, you'll see the recently viewed files window. If you have not done analysis before, you won't see this until you have saved some files. Um, you can type into the search bar to restrict the, the files, and that way once you've got a lot of files, you can actually find what you're looking for. The clean up list button <clears throat> will delete the old um, deleted files. When you start your new analysis, you go to File, New Analysis, or you can pr press Control N. This opens up the new analysis window. First you put in your input directory. Um, and then you put in your output directory. I would suggest when you put your output directory that you choose something that isn't your installation directory so that you don't have that um, confused with a large number of files from analyses. Then you choose your operating procedure name. The operating procedure is what we call the lab settings for a particular kit the definition. Choose your internal land standard. Um, and then if these are not grayed out, you can actually modify the, uh, the analysis threshold and the ladder and ILS thresholds as well. Finally, you press OK. Your analysis runs. Um, when you do a single analysis, um, OSIRIS will actually, if it succeeds, the analysis will open up um, into the table view. Otherwise, a batch window will open. Um, OSIRIS will analyze all of the subdirectories in the selected directory. So if you put multiple folders in, you can analyze them all at, at one time. If you've analyzed multiple directories, it will tell you the status, whether they've failed or whether they've completed. If your analysis fails, there are a number of reasons. The most common ones, my favorite one, this is what I do myself, is I choose the wrong operating procedure. You have to choose the right kit definition or it won't work. Similarly, if you choose the wrong ILS, if there is no ladder, you need to have a ladder present in your analysis to, for the run to succeed. If the ladder ILS peaks are below threshold or if some of the peaks are missing, such as if they're not collected, Finally, if the latter peaks are below the threshold or if there are no FSAs, these are all causes um, of failures. Once your analysis is complete, um, what you do is you select the analysis that you want to look at. You click the View Selection button. If your analysis fails, you can actually select that and View Selection so that you can troubleshoot the latter to check and see if all of your peaks are there. There's also a Details button, which will give you trouble, other troubleshooting details. And if you need to ask us questions, the details there can sometimes be helpful as, so that we can give you some idea of what to do. You can also reanalyze your selection um, by changing the, the thresholds. So if your ILS, um, if some of those peaks were below threshold, you can actually change the threshold and rerun your analysis. When it first opens up, um, what you see is the table view. This is a little bit different than what um, most people are used to. Um, there's also a graph view, the classic sort of stacked graph, electropherograms that people are used to seeing. Um, in the table view, you have basically three panels. The top panel is your table. Center panel gives you a preview of whichever sample or locus you want to look at in that table. And the bottom panel gives you notifications of issues and problems. So the preview button at the upper left will actually allow you to turn that preview pane on and off to give yourself some more screen real estate if you need it for the table. 
when you're looking at the table, there are basically a number of different columns. There are the low side, the columns for the low side. There's a column for channels that may have issues, for the internal marker that may have issues, and the sample column, which will give you either the green check mark or the red X. Um, the green check mark means the sample is passed with no issues. The red X means that there are still remaining issues that need to be addressed. Um, the cells themselves in the loci will be either white for having passed, this is blank because the latter has too many alleles, we don't put the alleles in, calls in it. Um, the yellow cells are indicative of a locus that's passed in a sample that has other issues, the red cells show um, loci that have problems. When you're looking at the preview, if you want to take a look at a particular locus, you click the, the locus. That will zoom the preview in to um, the locus in question. Down in the bottom right panel, then, you'll see notices of problems. In this particular case, the locus has a peak with laser off scale at that location. You can see that very small peak there, um, which tends to be indicative of pull-up. In the left-hand <coughs> panel, when you're in this view, you will see information about the peaks. What you can do also is you can click a sample. For example, click the positive control here. And at that point, the lower left-hand, you'll see all the alleles, which is not particularly helpful. But in the lower left-hand panel, you'll also see helpful links to um, uh, to accomplish editing of the various issues in that sample. In the table toolbar, there's one button that's particularly helpful in terms of sorting your samples. You can sort by file name, by sample name, or severity, or the displayed name. Um, you can select the alleles that will display in both the cells and in the preview, you can choose allele, base pair, or a few time and peak area. You can also choose what to display in terms of file name, either the file name, the FSA file name, or the sample name in that file. When you open the graph view, you can do this a couple of different ways. There's a graph button at the upper left, which opens the selected sample to the particular selected locus. You can double click on a sample name to open the sample, or you can double click on a cell to both open in the graph view and zoom to that particular locus. So this is what the graph view looks like if you've double clicked the file name. In the graph view, there is a toolbar as well that has a number of different buttons, and we will view these as we do the demonstration. When you hover over labels in either the preview or the graph view electropherograms, you can hover over the allele labels or the artifact labels, and what will happen is you will get a box that opens up with information about what that peak has. In this case, this is an artifact. It says that the signal is a possible off-ladder allele and that the uh, width of the peak is unusual. So at this point, I'd like to do um, a little bit of a demonstration of OSIRIS. The program itself will do a live demonstration. Um, I've installed this in the uh, documents directory. You can see that the logo pops up. In this case, because I've actually done some analysis using this installation, I have some recently viewed files. Close that window. I'm going to start a new analysis. In this particular case, the analysis window opens up, and what I need to do is I need to select the file that um, I want to analyze. You'll note that the um, OSIRIS test analysis directory has a number of different um, sets of data that you can use as test data. I would recommend, if you have data of your own, that you try it with that. But this is data that you can play around with. Um, in particular, the identifier file um, folder has um, a folder that has a number of labeled artifacts 
in it, and if you want to see what how it treats different artifacts, you can take a look at that. In this particular case, today we'll be looking at PowerPlex 16. This is um, sole source sample data from one of the NIST mixture uh, tests that they did. In this case, I've selected, um, I've actually started another directory. I'm not putting my data into the OSIRIS directory. I've made a subdirectory called OSIRIS output. If you type a directory name in here, if it does not exist, OSIRIS will create it for you. Then I need to select my operating procedure. You'll note that the majority of these are in brackets. Um, the ones in brackets, these are um, predefined. They're default, and they can't be customized. You can use them as a template for your own custom um, analyses. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one that I set up for today, specifically for this webinar. This is um, set up to be to model what a lot of casework laboratories are doing right now with relatively low um, analysis threshold of 50 RFU for the samples um, and 150 RFU for the ladders and 100 RFU for the ILS. Then I'm going to choose my ILS. I'm going to use the default one. You'll notice that this is actually all the same ILS marker system. However, it uses more or fewer of the actual markers themselves. So in this case, the highest molecular weight marker uses is 500 base pairs. And you want to make sure that you um, have data for all of the markers selected in this, in this ladder. Some of these actually remove at least one of the markers that uh, migrates anomalously. <clears throat> so I'll select the default, and then I'll run it. Because this is not very many samples, it takes a couple of seconds to run. I'm going to expand the full screen at this point. It opens up in the table view. You'll notice that we have the three panels here. Um, these panels can be modified to suit your screen better by dragging the edges. Um, and you'll see that there is the standard colors um, set up here. So what we're going to look at is, first of all, you can navigate um, by clicking any of these cells. You'll see that the white cells and the samples, like the positive control here, has passed because it has the green, um, the green checkbox. Some of these others have not passed because there are red Xs. The samples, the loci that have issues, for example, in this negative control, there's an artifact. There is a peak here that's been called. And you can hover over the artifact label to see what that is. It's an unexpected peak in the negative control. In here, you can navigate by clicking on the various cells, or you can use the mouse to navigate from cell to cell and from sample to sample. As you do that, you'll see the uh, electropherogram show up in the preview pane. And you'll see down in the bottom pane, the notifications pane, you'll see that there are um, unexpected alleles in this particular case because we've got a third peak and this is expecting a sole source sample here. In the left hand panel you'll see that there is peak information. It tells you about all the data about the peak including the RFU, the time, the peak area, the fit which is that measure of the quality of the peak shape. So let's take a look at um, Case number four here. First of all, let's uh, take a look at the sort order. We can actually sort these um, by either the file name or we can sort by the severity. In this case, we're sorted by severity. Case number four is this one here. And we can see that in this case, one of the SDR peaks was high in comparison to this. This is probably because of the um, heterozygous imbalance. In this locus here, there is a peak here. One of the things you can do, if you right-click, you can actually set various types of data in this particular view. So I think what we'll do now is we'll take a look at the stack graph here. So 
we can open either by clicking the graph button or we can open it by click, double clicking the sample name itself or we can open by double clicking the locus. I'm going to double click the locus. When we're opened in the graph view, you'll see that this is pretty tight because of the screen size on the laptop that I'm using here for the presentation. What you should do is you should go to the graph menu and select resizable plots. When you've done that, you can then grab the edge of the panes and you can adjust the size so that you get an appropriate size for the screen that you're looking at. When you are in the graph view, there are a number of things you can do. You can zoom out using the reset axis button. You'll notice as I hold the cursor over that button that I get a tooltip that pops up which tells me what um, the, the button actually does. When you want to zoom in, you can actually do it by the classical click, drag, and release, which will zoom into where you want to go. If you want to zoom in, you can also use the keys, the A and the D key. If you click in a particular, uh, in a particular pane, in a particular electropharogram, you'll see that it, that um, will actually activate. You can see a little green dot there. Once it's activated, you can use the D key to expand, to zoom in. You can use the A key to zoom back out. You can also use the X key to zoom the Y axis out and the W key to zoom the Y axis back in. Um, in addition to that, and probably one of the easiest things to do, is you can zoom in by clicking any one of the uh, locus markers which will zoom you to that particular locus and zoom and scale you to it. Um, in this particular case, we'll take a look at the, uh, the different buttons on the toolbar. The A button, which you can see here is selected as Analyze Data. Um, with any of these buttons, you can basically uh, change all the plots at once by holding down the Shift key when you do it. The R button will turn on the raw data. I'll turn the analyze data off. This is what the raw data looks like um, before. This is what uh, OSIRIS is actually using for its analysis. The L button will turn on the ladders. Um, this gives you the ability to see how well the peak matches up with the ladder. You can see this is slightly shifted to the left. Using the ladder labels button, you can turn the ladder labels on and off depending on how busy you need it or whether you need that information. Um, and finally, if you zoom out, this button here will display the baseline. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look right here. And this display here is in light blue is the baseline that's been subtracted from the raw data. Um, and as you can see, this stutter peak would be about half again as high um, in terms of its total RFU if the raw data hadn't been subtracted. Um, if you're doing low-level analysis, if you're pushing your analysis threshold down below 75 or maybe even 100, depending on the quality of your data, you should probably use baseline subtraction, which we call normalization. Okay. Um, the multiple button will basically set all the panels to be the same in terms of um, in terms of what you've got displayed. The table button will let you swap back and forth between the table and the display. When you have an issue such as this in D13, where this looks like it might be um, a pull-up, what we can do is we can use the channel buttons to display, to overlay the different colors to determine whether or not it is in fact a pull-up. Yeah, that looks like a pull-up. Particularly when you look at the raw data, you can see that there is a little bit of a sort of S-curve in there, which is pretty typical for pull-up peaks um, when you're looking at the raw data. In addition to that, there's the sync button. If you unclick the sync button, that allows you to um, unsynchronize 
the various different axes, um, which is handy if you want to zoom in on a particular y-axis. Um, the ILS button will display the ILS marker in each of the channels. Um, and the RFU button will display the RFU minimum analysis threshold. Okay. When you're uh, displaying labels, you can display um, uh, let me get this set here. Let's just reset the axis and go back here. You can change your labels on your peaks to base pairs, to your RFU value. Um, and if you're looking for a display for um, nice printing, you can actually display no labels at all. Um, this is the artifact display. Right now it's set for critical artifacts. So you'll see that this uh, says that the base pair residual exceeds the threshold. In other words, this is shifted beyond the threshold set by the laboratory. And this one displays no, uh, this stutter peak displays no uh, label. If I change it to all artifacts, that displays both the critical artifacts, such as this, which requires review, but it also dis uh, displays non-critical artifacts, such as this stutter peak here. This tooltip box says this peak has restricted priority, and this peak is a stutter. Okay, once you've got your data, um, as you, you probably want to export it, and what I'm going to show you now is how to do that. I'm going to go back to the table. Um, and first of all, I'm going to set up the export. Um, when you try to do your first export, if you look for it on the file menu, you'll see that there is no export of data aside from the export CMF file. That's because I haven't actually set one up yet. There are a couple of exports that we actually distribute with OSIRIS. We also have a significant number of others so that if you have a format requirement that's not being met, you can talk to us and we may have a solution for you already. So, okay, there are no export file types available. I'm going to select new to make a new one. Um, in the config folder of the OSIRIS install, there's the tab. This will, and this is described, by the way, in the, the OSIRIS manual, so you can set this up yourself using the user's guide. I'm going to open that. It's chosen the default name of spreadsheet, which I'm going to leave. Um, you can put your own name on it, though, if you like. Um, actually, I'm going to go back. Uh, allow user to override will allow the user to change the file name extension. You can just say next to that. This tick box right here will actually allow you to automatically run an export as soon as the analysis is completed, and that is without any other analyst intervention. Um, this allows laboratories to automate processes. You say finish. This is my export. I will say done. Then when I go to file, you'll see that now it has an export. If you have multiples, it will give you an extra little drop-down to allow you to select different exports. I'll say export spreadsheet. OSIRIS then notifies me that I have not edited or dealt with four of these samples. We can see the four uh, samples with X's. I'll say, yes, I want to export the data anyway. It allows me to choose a file name to do this. I'll call it web export, or export as this case may be, and uh, we'll call this a tab file. And I'll save. At that point, it asks you if you want the off-ladder allele labels in the, the table or not. I'll say yes, because that gives me an indication of which ones are off-ladder alleles. Um, most people, if you are 
importing this data, you don't want that um, because you're probably your limb system won't be happy with you if you do. If you click the file, view file location, that will actually allow you to open up the folder that has the file in it, which makes it easy to find and review. Show channel numbers in the column headings just basically puts a channel number in addition to the locus. Um, most labs don't use that. I say OK, and it opens it up. I'm going to look at that. Here it is at the top. I can then open that with, um, with various different files. In this case, I will choose I guess I won't choose, I don't see Excel. There's Excel. I can open it up, open, and there is your table in Excel. Now obviously you can set this up in almost any format. Um, it's very, very flexible. You can set it up for um, any layout um, and any kind of data format as well. Um, if you have particular requirements for your limb system or for programs that you use, feel free to uh, ask us. Um, but if you have somebody who is handy with XSLT, you can program your own. Okay, we'll close this. We'll go back to our table. What I'd like to do now is briefly show you the lab settings, how to set these up. Go to Tools. Lab settings, and there are keystrokes for all of these. The lab settings allows the users to set things up the way they um, want to do it according to their own protocols. There are various tabs here. The general tab allows you to choose between FSA and HID formatted data and to choose the default standard for this particular operating procedure. What you're going to need to do to start it is you're going to want to choose a template. Um, in this case, let's choose a PowerPlex 16 template. This can't be edited because it's a default, so we'll say new. We'll choose PowerPlex 16. We'll type in test. Um, and then we can actually edit these things. We can edit and change the different things. So FSA and HID file formats, you may want to um, allow the user to override. That allows the user to override the, um, the default internal marker, and it also allows the user to override um, actually just the default marker there. You can type notes in about that particular operating procedure. You can also put protocol names or numbers here, a lot numbers if you wish. For the files and sample names, you can define the strings in the file names or in the sample names. For ladder, for positive control, negative control, for possible mixture, for a single source sample, and then all of the other CODIS um, categories. What we recommend that you do is that you um, change the strings um, that you use for search strings to identify these different samples to what your laboratory uses and then delete the defaults that we've put in so that you won't um, find a sample that contains dash AL being identified as a ladder. Mm -hmm. You can also set the search to determine which of these samples are which. So in other words, when it's searching Ladders for ladders, in this case it's searching the file names for AL and for the word ladder. Um, or you, but you can also set it to search in the, within the sample names. The Locus and ILS thresholds tab <clears throat> allows you to choose uh, thresholds for various uh, filters, including a fractional filter, which is a global filter to remove uh, samples below a certain percentage within a lo of the highest peak within a Locus. The same thing for pull-up peaks. There's stutter plus stutter, a ventilation threshold for um, minus a ventilation, um, heterozygote balance, and the homozygote threshold, which will <clears throat> allow you to determine what level uh, homozygote peaks are too low to pass automatically, aren't tall enough. 
For sample thresholds, you can do the analysis thresholds um, and other various thresholds here. And you can set a variety of different parameters, um, which are described in the user's guide. I uh, won't go through them all, but uh, you can certainly look them up in the user's guide. The ones that I would point out, however, are normalized raw data relative to baseline. Um, that is one that you should set if you're using, that will do the baseline subtraction. Um, if you are doing low-level threshold analysis, if you're trying to push your thresholds below 75, and you should take a look at the disable low-level height filters for known mixtures um, that's described in the user's guide, but that will allow you to differentially apply um, these various filters, fractional filter, um, stutter filter, ventilation filter, so that you can actually analyze both reference samples and mixture samples in the same analysis um, and apply filters to the only to the reference samples, the known samples, so that you can um, then put that data directly into a, um, a mixture calculation software. A number of different laboratories are using OSIRIS um, to feed their data into uh, their mixture software. Finally, there's the Assignments tab. This allows you, um, the off-ladders alleles, allows you to predefine off-ladder alleles so that the program will recognize them as being accepted alleles and will not complain about them. You won't get artifact notifications. There is also um, a tab that allows you to define your own custom uh, positive controls so that the program will actually check the, uh, the correct allele calls within those um, custom positive controls or to add new kit positive controls to um, the definition, kit definition, your operating procedure. And finally, the accept and review tab, which allows you to set um, the number of reviews that is required by the laboratory, which then, um, which OSIRIS will then enforce in the software. If you're evaluating this, you want to check this here, allow reviewer to modify username. That allows um, an evaluator to serve both as the first reviewer and as the second reviewer um, without having to log in under a different um, username. And then you just say OK. Um, one of the things that's worthwhile noting is when you're actually Modifying the user settings, sometimes um, the lock button at the bottom left will be um, not be grayed out, and you will not be able to change your settings. And that's to prevent you from changing the settings while analysis is being run, or for another user when uh, multiple users are using it on the network, um, uh, to prevent them from changing the settings while you're actually running your analysis. If the lock button is lit up, then what you can do is click the lock button until it grays back out, and then you'll be able to uh, be able to modify the settings. One of the buttons in the graph view that's worth noting is the parameters button. The parameters button is particularly handy because it gives you both the name of the input directory and a link. If you click it, it'll actually open the directory up. The input directory and the output directory um, and the operating procedure name as well. Um, be aware that if you click the parameters button, it is not the same thing as if you open the tools um, lab settings button because if you open the parameters here, the lab settings from this parameters, you'll see that everything is grayed out. This is a historical record of what was used to run this particular analysis. It is stored in the analysis file itself and can't be modified. You have to really have to go back and change the lab settings using the tools menu and rerun your analysis if you want to change settings here. Um, the other thing that's handy here is if you open the parameters from the graph view, it will tell you which ladder file was used um, to do the analysis in case the latter file itself has artifacts in it. Um, generally, OSIRIS is very robust in analyzing ladders. It rarely makes mistakes. Um, and 
uh, but sometimes it does point out artifacts such as spikes that um, are not problematical in terms of the correctness of the latter analysis, but um, we want to make sure that we point those artifacts out. At this point, I think that we will probably open this up for questions. If you have any questions and you haven't typed it in yet, um, please go ahead and do that. And we will try to address some of these questions as we go along. So the first question I see is, is OSIRIS used for cell line validation? And the answer is yes, there is uh, at least one laboratory using it for cell line validation. Um, we would be happy to discuss uh, settings for cell line validation separately. Um, these settings are really not intended for set cell line validation, but you can certainly set it up for that. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Is the GenePrint 10 system, you know, is that a, I'm presuming that is a kit, um, that can certainly be added. You can add kits to um, Osiris. Uh, there's a description of how to do that in the user's guide, um, and we would be happy to help you out with that. Um, if there are uh, commercial kits that are not in Osiris and somebody wants to add one of those, we would be happy once um, the kit is defined to add that to the distribution for future releases. Um, so how do you uh, total wheel calls, no longer called, how to fix? Bob? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what, we'll, we'll address that. Um, if the, the questioner could um, expand that a little bit, we'll see if we can come back to that. Do you have the target mass of the PowerPlex 16 uh, mixture? It's not clear quite what you mean by the target mass, but certainly the area under the curve, yes, that is available um, for each individual peak, not necessarily uh, in total for the entire curve. So Osiris significance to the student, um, not into forensics. This is actually a tremendously helpful program um, for training if you're looking at STR analysis because one of the things that it does is it tells you exactly what it thinks each peak head's problem is if it's an artifact. So it will tell you whether it thinks it's a pull-up, it will tell you whether it thinks um, if this laser off scale, if it's stutter, if there's a demolition. So it can be very, very helpful in terms of uh, Student training that's been used in the Middle East to do training for forensic users. Uh, can you click off the artifacts directly from the electrophorogram? Um, this is on our to-do list, and this is um, in the uh, development pipeline for the immediate future. Um, not yet, but very soon. Um, and again, I would uh, encourage people to sign up on the announcements list so that you get notified of the latest and greatest releases. Um, that is something that we have to have available to make it much easier much sooner. Notification of video release. Yes, that is, we will notify the, the people who have signed up um, for the webinar uh, when the releases, the video is released and also as to exactly how to, uh, how to do that. Uh, next question is, can I view the sample information, um, the injection time and the voltage? At this point, you can't do that um, in OSIRIS, but that is something that we are actually also looking at. That's a user request for um, development, and that's definitely something that, um, that we have on our list, our to-do list. Next question is, how do you estimate the threshold value? Um, every laboratory um, estimates their own. The forensic laboratories are typically um, nowadays beginning to do this by looking at the noise um, levels within the, the channels for their particular system. And every laboratory is going to have differences um, because of the different, uh, the different machinery um, and just the, the way it's set up. Um, laboratories have used everything from 150 uh, RFU for FSA files all the way down to below 50 RFU. If you're using HID files, you'll probably, because they have a much higher signal level, they also have a much higher noise level, and you'd have to choose a higher threshold value. To some extent, if you don't want to look at the noise, if you don't want to do noise calculations, you can actually just do this empirically. Just try it out. 
Can you manually edit allele calls? Yes, you can definitely manually edit the allele calls. You can actually change the number. Um, and we could probably do a quick uh, demonstration of that. So possibility of support for startup use. We do uh, have, there is a, a, an email address that you can um, send questions to, and we definitely uh, try to, to help our users as much as we can. We have um, some training materials on its use, um, which we can make available, uh, eventually we'll make available on the web. For non-human STRs, sure, this can be used for non-human STRs. Um, that would mean putting a kit in, you'd need to have a ladder but you could make a, a ladder yourself. It wouldn't be that difficult to do, and I'd be happy to discuss that with anybody. Please send us an email. The email address is forensics at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov, and we'll actually put that up and email that to the users in addition. So, can you override the ladder requirement? I'm not sure exactly what that question means. You need to have a ladder, um, but there are possibilities for using non-traditional ladders, which we'd be happy to discuss with somebody. Um, to create new panels and bins, that would be creating a new kit, kit definition that's described in the user's manual. Um, and again, if you have any issues, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to work with you on those. I wanted to do a really quick little editing demonstration. We'll take a look at our simplest case right here. Okay, so let me show you editing and wheel call since we have a few minutes left. So I've selected this uh, a wheel call here. Um, this, it turns out, if you take a look, is um, probably a spike right in here. We will see you've noticed that there's an allele, uh, an artifact notification. We'll go back and we will edit that call off. So what you do is you go to the table menu, you edit. There are a number of ways of, of getting at this, but I'm going to show you the simplest way. Edit D13. Then the edit box comes up. And at this point, what I can do is this is peak one is the nine peak right here that I want to get rid of. I'm going to simply untick the allele peak box. I'm going to say 9 is a spike, so that I'm going to create an audit trail, which will show up in the review acceptance and notes here. And I say yes, you'll notice that the allele call is gone. I could also go back and I could change that to add the artifact peak notice as well because I want to make sure that that shows up. You'll see now that my notes are showing up here, that it remains as part of the, the permanent record in the file. And I'm going to say add artifact and say OK. And then when I look at that in the, uh, it's not showing up. It showed up last time. We'll take a look at that and see. Oh, <laughs> that's because I have critical set. Um, yeah, thank you, Doug. That's correct. When I show all artifacts, then that artifact notice is going to come back up. And you'll see if I box something and don't want to blow up to a tiny little pixel, I can actually move back and it will not blow up. So other questions. Um, is there an audit trail available? The audit trail is in the um, in the software. If that was, if you wanted an audit trail, a printable audit trail, that's something that we could certainly um, examine in terms of development. But currently, you can't print it out separately. Um, a number of laboratories are looking to go paperless using um, OSIRIS and the, the files themselves as the documentation for what they've done. Um, is it possible to add more than one label for a plot? And the answer to that is not yet, but very soon. That's actually been developed um, by some collaborators at Wright State University. Um, and that is something that we're going to put in probably, although possibly not this next release, which is out very soon, but um, almost certainly in the release following that, which shouldn't be that far off. 
Um, is it all possible to print the electropharogram? Actually, I think what we'll do is we'll follow up with additional questions via email to folks um, because it's about time to wrap up the meeting. Ben, do you have anything to add? We can also post these on FAQ. And we will also post answers um, to these questions on FAQ. And so I'd like to thank you all for attending the, the webinar. Um, if you have any questions, again, um, we will be happy to answer them in the FAQ issue for the ones you've typed in. You can send your questions um, to the email, which is on the OSIRIS homepage, and that goes into our queue, and we will get back to you on that as well.